philosophy in terms of demonology has never been accomplished. As I have done a lot of research this year in trying to unearth whether philosophers have been talking about the subject, I, it was remarkable to find that hardly anything has been said about the subject of demons or even angels. The second attitude that some people take is to be overzealous or superstitious, I should say, with respect to demons. Meaning that these uh, certain people will tend to think that demons exist you know, under every uh, stool, uh, they're causing you to have a bad shave in the morning, uh, they're there to make your water too hot or too cold, that kind of a thing, where they're about as ubiquitous or ever-present as the air you breathe around us, but that their engagement in the world is pervasive. So what I'm going to do is, as they said in Star Trek, go where no person has gone before, and that is to broach the subject philosophically. Now, why does anyone want to talk about a philosophy of demonology? And am I being presumptuous to sort of speak on behalf of God? Well, one of the things that philosophers have done all through history, and we see this in the philosophy of religion in general, is to try to wrap our minds around the idea of who God is and certain attributes that he has. So what I'm going to do is take the same approach that Christians have been doing for 2,000 years and approach the subject of demonology and try to provide a working model that retains every bit of robust of a doctrine that demonology is. In other words, everything I taught and explained from the Bible last time should hold. We don't have to give up belief in demons. Now, why would we want to talk about then a philosophy of demonology? What's the purpose? Because this particular field is you know, by and large, almost laughed at by the world at large. Okay, it's something that sort of has gone by the way of the dinosaur in most people's minds. The idea that it's, it's just like how leeches were to medicine. Uh, demons sort of, oh, well, the, the old idea that demons were somehow interacting with people and causing people to do sins and ill behavior, you know, that's, that's a product of the old fairy tale stories of long time ago. But we're in an enlightened generation. We're much smarter now. Uh, you know, we understand mathematics and logic and reasoning and philosophy and this sort of thing. So we can give up childish beliefs in demons and fairies, and, uh, but still maintain belief in God. Well, I'm here to argue tonight that we don't have to do that. We don't have to check our brains in at the door when it comes to demonology. I do not want to take away from as robust a definition of what it means for demons to behave the way the Bible describes them, but at the same time, I also want to uh, show that we don't have to have all of these sort of what I call superstitious auxiliary ideas that come along with it. Demons tipping chairs over, you know, getting into your salt shaker and uh, over salting your soup in the middle of the night or something like that. But I'm actually here to argue a view which anyone is welcome to disagree with, a view that's unique to myself in suggesting that maybe that's not possible. Maybe it's not possible because when we look at what the Bible, strictly speaking, has to say, and then we wrap our minds around what this must mean, I think, personally, it comes together to give us a worldview about demons, where the interaction is real, okay, that they do tend to interact with our minds, and that's how they gain entry into the world. So that I sort of distance myself from the idea that demons would physically manifest themselves, that they would cause physical things like actually generate cancer in people although I think that they do in fact cause ailments in people it might be the same thing then with respect to the serpent so how might this play out in the garden then it could be that there was not a physical snake sort of suspended from a tree carrying on a conversation which you might imagine would engender all sorts of questions like how does a, a a serpent or a snake suddenly have vocal cords. Again, does Satan have creative powers to give it vocal cords? Um, and then, of course, uh, I mean, the fact that he would be, have the ability to possess animals raises, of course, an interesting separate question. Um, with the exception of one other passage in the entire Bible, no verses say that Satan or demons have anything to do with animals. But nonetheless, here's the tempter in the garden talking to Eve. Another question. 
haven't we been tempted ourselves today, historically, by Satan? We often speak of, the Lord told me to do this, I feel the calling of the Lord to do that. But we've had many stories, many of us could share, where we've heard something outside of ourselves or within ourselves say, do this, go do that. Doesn't that look good? That's exactly the sort of language that's used in the account here. What we're witnessing, possibly, is Eve is experiencing the same sort of satanic uh, suggestions given by the devil himself, literally, to look at that fruit. You can be like God, you see. Just to further underscore this possible interpretation, the second point I'd like to make is that, curiously, Adam is there with Eve because the passage says she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Now here's an interesting question. So you and your spouse are together. One of them is talking to a snake, which would be rather, I think, bizarre or out of the ordinary, even for Adam and Eve. The serpent is clearly having this conversation and tempting her to do something wrong. All the while, Adam is quiet. He doesn't participate in the conversation. He doesn't say anything. Moreover, when offered the fruit from Eve, he asks no questions. He takes it and eats it simply because he's, he was suggested by his wife to do so. You know, nary a word from Adam does he say, wait a minute, should we be listening to the serpent? You see? Interesting. Again, I don't want to draw too much out of this, but I think it's a real interesting read to see that this might not be a literal snake talking, but it's just a matter of speaking of Satan in the garden tempting Eve.